gift recommendations. Please remove a tag from the tree and print your name and ticket number on the sign-up sheet. Our hope is for each child to receive an outfit, one large gift, two medium gifts, and stocking stuffers from the shop. More tags will be added to the tree once we have our next group of sign-ups. Once you remove a tag, please hang an ornament from the basket in its place. If you have any questions, please contact the church office or Brian directly at 419-738-8849 or at brian at walpockfirst.org. Thank you for your willingness to help spread Christmas cheer and the love and hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dylan Stoss. I'm a retired uh, pastor in the uh, West Ohio Conference, the United Methodist Church. And uh, my wife and I have been attending here for, um, gosh, I don't know, a little over a year, I guess. Uh, we had a little trouble finding a church when we retired, but uh, we like it here. And uh, Josh is a friend. So, um, he has occasionally asked me to fill in for him. I think this is the second time I've preached, so you may remember me if you were here then. Um, otherwise, it's good to be with you, and I invite you to, uh, to begin to worship God this morning by, uh, by bowing with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us. Lord, we lift up to you the cares and concerns of our hearts. Some we share and some are silent and unspoken. We lift up to you, Lord, the, those we love, our family and our friends. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you for your many blessings. We pray for this, your church. We pray for all those around us, our neighbors and friends, for those who are seated around us this morning. And we ask that in these things and in all things, that you would lead us and guide us, keep us and protect us. For we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. of stone, give them hearts for love alone, I will speak my word to them, who shall I 
Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I have. The COVID virus has changed uh, so many things about our lives and uh, unfortunately changed many things about the church. One of those is how we make our offering. Um, one of the good things that's come of it is that a lot of people now make their offering online, uh, which is uh, a very easy and handy way to do it. Uh, but if you still bring your offering and don't mail it and then you still drop it in the box, uh, that happens at the box at the entrances on the way in or out. And if you haven't already done so, we invite you to make that offering uh, when you leave by this door at the end of the service. At any rate, uh, we want to thank God for his blessings and we want to pray uh, over our offerings. So I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the many ways you've blessed us. We know that every good gift comes from your hand. And Lord, we offer back to you a small portion of what you have given us as our offering. But Lord, we pray that our offering might be much more than this, that we might offer to you our very lives, our total commitment. And we ask that you would bless our offering, put it to your good use. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, do you, uh, do you pray with me or do I pray that alone? Nobody will tell me. Will you pray with me, please? I, in the first service, they didn't, and it threw me back a little bit. So they were silent, and I thought, well, let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. This morning's scripture lesson comes to us from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 to 14. And these are the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the people of Philippi. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whoever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participating participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. I'm a little bit of a roamer, so uh, I'll start here and be uh, all over here, if not down there. I used to, the churches I used to serve, the the video guys would just, I'd drive them crazy, because they couldn't just set a shot up on the pulpit, or two cameras up on the pulpit, and then just cut from camera to camera, and I'm always there for them. They have to constantly be panning and constantly be refocusing and I'm down and I'm up and I'm around so I try to keep you engaged this morning I've noticed that in my mind uh, the sermons that I like usually have at least a couple of things in common one is that they have a point don't you hate a sermon that doesn't have a point point? and number two is that they're they're brief and to the point so I'll try, I won't keep you long because the 11 o'clock service starts in uh, 44 minutes, so. Uh, But I want to have a point, and I want to keep it brief. Reminds me of the story of the the pastor who tended to be long-winded and to go on and on. And uh, one Sunday he got up in the pulpit and he apologized for the the band-aid he had on his face. He said, the, the, the thing is, I was uh, thinking about my sermon this morning while I was shaving, and I cut my face. Well, he went on and preached, went over time as usual. And the next day, when the pastor and the treasurer were going over the offering, they found a note in the offering. And the note said, next time... Think about your face and cut the sermon. (laughs) So I'll do the best I can. You all know who John Wesley was, right? You should, because you're in a Methodist church. John Wesley, if you don't know, um, and not everybody does, John Wesley was an Anglican uh, priest, a priest in the Church of England, and he was a, a reformer. And he was, a, he was on fire for God. And he founded the Methodist movement, which later grew into the Methodist church. And John Wesley used to, ch- when he founded the movement, he had classes of lay people and he had uh, preachers who he appointed to preach in different uh, areas. And he used to ask his people, when he got together with them, whether it was at a class meeting or when he met with pastors, he, he would always ask them one question. That was, what is the state of your soul? How goes it with your soul? And I want you to remember that because we're going to come back to that 
later. That's going to be the point of this sermon. I know when I was in seminary, I had a professor who said, there are three things to do in preaching. This is how you, this is how you construct a sermon. You, you tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And I think, in 30-some years of preaching, I think he was right. You tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. You've made your point. Several years ago, a United Methodist bishop prescribed the remedy for the ailment of the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church, like all churches, has had its problems. And this bishop had a remedy for our problems. He said the old paradigm was that we focus on our problems. You know, I, I thought about this as a, as a high school football coach. Um, I thought the same thing. He said, the old paradigm is that we focus on the negative. We focus on our problems to try to get better, to try to fix our problems. He said, if we don't have enough money, what do we focus on? Stewardship. He said, if we don't have enough space, what do we focus on? The building." He said, if we don't have enough people, we focus on attendance and membership. We're always focused on the negatives. We're always focused on our problems. But he said, the new paradigm is this. Very simple. Make sure that the main thing is the main thing. Make sure the main thing is the main thing. And the main thing for the church is the spiritual growth of disciples. That's what we're about. Our job is to make disciples for Jesus Christ. And that means new people. Making new disciples means converting people. But that's not all. That's too easy. That lets you off the hook. Making disciples also means you growing your spirit. That's the main thing. All of us, the church as a whole, growing in discipleship. Praying, Bible study, worship, those are, are how we grow in discipleship. That's how our spirit grows, not meetings. Nobody ever grew their spirit in a meeting, in a committee meeting. It's ridiculous. Meetings don't grow the church. Money doesn't grow the church. Membership statistics don't grow the church. And let me tell you this, not even doing good deeds, not even doing justice grows your spirit. That's not how you grow spiritually. But if we take care of the main thing, the spiritual health of the church and ourselves as individuals, those other things will take care of themselves. You know what? When I served, the churches I served, I never once in any of my churches had money problems. Never once had budget problems. And we raised millions of dollars in the years that I was pastoring, built uh, and paid for uh, additions to buildings and new buildings and mergers and and. Never had money problems. You know why? Because I found that when a church has a very healthy spirit, has a, a, a vibrant spiritual life, people give. People give and give and give. People who are healthy in their spirit are good givers. In fact, one way you can tell if somebody's got real problems, either in their personal life or got a problem with the church, before they ever leave, their giving will go down. Same thing is true of, of justice ministries and social justice. If that's your thing, people who have a, a healthy spirit, whose soul is going well, they're involved in ministry. They're feeding the hungry. They're clothing the naked. They're healing wounds. People who are walking close with God, they're all about doing justice. People who have a, 
a weak spirit, who, who are not walking closely with God, they don't do those things. Keep the main thing the main thing, and everything else falls in place. The money, the membership, the attendance. When a church is full of the Spirit, and the people's spiritual health is, is in a good place, other people are attracted to that church. Because that's what the world needs, and that's what people want. According to this paradigm, the important thing is not to focus on problems, but to understand the flow. People come into the church, like you came into the church today, often bringing someone with them. Did you? This is interesting to me. This has always fascinated me. It's been repeated in study after study. Over 80% of the new members who join a church came to that church the very first time because someone they know invited them. Because someone they know invited them to come. Do you know how hard it is to go to a new church? And I've done it many times. As a lay person, when I was a teacher and coach, uh, my wife and I did it with our family. And even as a pastor, you know, you get reassigned in the Methodist church every few years and you, and you go to a new place. It is so hard to, to walk into a new church. You don't know, you know, you don't know where you should park or whose space you might be parking in. You don't know which door to go in. in a lot of, this, one's, this was pretty straightforward. But in a lot of churches I've visited, and, I, and I, when I'm, even when I was pastoring, when I'd go on vacation, I'd always go to church, usually to a Methodist church. And so, it's so intimidating. I don't know what door to use. I don't know. And when I get inside, uh, where am I? I'm lost. There's a hallway here and a hallway there. And where's the sanctuary? And, and so many times there's no sign. And... and you know what was hard about finding a church after we retired? We've been retired now two years. Visited a lot of churches. One of the reasons we liked it here is because the, you're friendly. You're friendlier than most. This is, the, this is God's honest truth. I'm not making this up. We went to a Methodist church around Lima, where, and we live between here and Lima in the country. Went to a Methodist church this side of Lima, and there were two greeters at the door, two ladies, and they were talking to each other about something. Standing there holding the bulletins. And my wife and I knew people never been there. We walked in. This lady, this greeter, never made eye contact, never said one word to us, never said good morning, never said hello. She kept talking to the other lady and just stuck a bulletin out toward me. Guess how many times we went there? Why would you go back to a place like that? But in a church that's full of the love of God, that doesn't happen. If they keep the main thing the main thing. The flow is circular. People come in, they bring others with them. If you, and, and the worst part is, you know what the worst part is when you visit a new church, is when you finally get to the sanctuary, you found the right door, you got the car parked, you walk in and you, you don't know where to sit. And the worst sin you can commit is to sit in somebody's seat. I was pastoring a church in Portsmouth, Ohio, and, I, and this happened. It, it got corrected. I heard a man, he was a lawyer too, he, he was an intelligent guy. I heard him tell some visitors they were in his seat. I spoke to him. But if you invite somebody, and I wouldn't say I'll pick you up with COVID, <laughs> but I would say, come to our church. Great things are happening. Great people there. Our pastor's wonderful. The music is fantastic. Thank you for that uh, hymn again. I, one of my favorites. Come to our church. I will be waiting for you at the west door. So he knows where he's parking. He knows where to go. I will meet you at the door and I'll take you to our seats. You've just eliminated all their fears. All those terrible things about going to church for the first time. Now he knows what parking lot he's going to be in. He knows what door he wants to go to. He knows when he gets there he's going to find a familiar smiling face who's glad to see him. 
and he knows when he gets seated, it'll be in that guy's pew where he's not taking up somebody else's seat. People come to the church, they bring others, and when you get here, you get fed spiritually. When you get here, you keep the main thing the main thing. You attend to your spirit. You get fueled, you get fired up. And then you go back out into the world, and what do you do? You do ministry. You carry the love of Christ out there, and then you come back to the church again, and the whole process repeats. There's a flow when you keep the main thing the main thing. People come to the church where they're nurtured and fed spiritually through prayer and Bible study and through fellowship, certainly, and through worship. They go out and it begins again. If we focus on the problems we have as a church or as individuals, either way, that will not fix the problem. It just makes us feel aggravated and anxious and resentful. It's the same thing in the world. Same thing with politics today. The focus is all on the negative. People just get aggravated and anxious and worried. And, and you've seen it happen probably. You sit around in, in, in meetings and you blame that the problem is money. You, you, know, you blame the pastor because he doesn't preach well enough. Or you blame the trustees because they haven't managed the finances well enough. Or, if the problem is people, you blame the greeters because the hospitality chairperson, because they're not doing hospitality right, and the greeters are doing what I just described. Or the pastor, again, pastor always gets his share of the blame because he's not attracting people. It, it just, it just de generates into a, into a mess. And what kind of spirit is that for a church to have? Because you're so focused on the negative. You know, remember the old song, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. That's so true. Let's be focused on the main thing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Rather, strive for the kingdom of God. Strive first he says, first for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We can get so busy within the church going to meetings, worrying about money, about human resources, that the main thing gets lost. And then our, if the main thing gets lost, our behavior, our actions, our words, end up working against the main thing instead of for it. Think about this. Over the next few weeks, most of us will spend more time talking about the football season with our friends than we'll spend talking about God with our friends. Spend more time talking about the Browns or the Bengals or the Steelers or whoever. More time talking about Ohio State or whoever. And if football's not your thing, just substitute anything else. You'll spend more time talking about the things that are of your interest than you will talking about God to your friends and family. Over the next several months, we'll spend more time worrying about our children, about their Christmas presents, about their basketball team, about their prom dress, about their graduation party, then we will spend worrying about our children and whether or not they're headed for heaven. That's not keeping the main thing the main thing. It's, these things are all good. I, prom is great. Graduation parties are great. Ball teams are great. I'm a big sports fan. It's not that they're not important. It's just that there is one thing that is more important. Paul isn't saying all those things that were formerly so important in his life are not important anymore. He says in comparison to the main thing, they're like rubbish. So he's saying the main thing is this thing for which we press on. I love that term, press on. I love the implication of it. I, I love the, 
the, the imagery of it. Press on. Press on toward that goal. Never give up. Strive, strive, strive. That's the first half of the sermon where I describe the situation. Now, the next half of the sermon deals with the question, what do we do about it? If we're to press on, how do we press on? Paul says the main thing is to grow more Christ-like. But how do we grow more like Christ if we don't know what Christ is like? So our priority ought to be to be connected to the church. I'm glad you're here this morning. You didn't have to be. It's a voluntary thing. But you're here because you want to be connected to the church. Because if the goal of life is to be more Christ-like, then we need to know what Christ is like. And who is going to show us what Christ is like other than the church? Is Is the media going to show you Christ? That's laughable. The news media is not going to lift up Christ. Is the Hollywood going to show you Christ? That's laughable. Other than an occasional Christian movie, Hollywood's not going to show you Christ. Is the the sports world going to show you Christ? Tim Tebow wasn't even allowed to take a knee and say thank you when he scored a touchdown. Who's going to show you Christ in this world? What institution in this world is the educational system going to show you Christ? Except for Christian colleges, what college is Christ-friendly? Even Christ-tolerant, much less showing you Christ. There's one place where you're going to learn what Christ is like. And that's the church. First, we ought to be connected to the church. Second priority ought to be to be more involved in Bible study. And Josh has been talking about this, and I agree with him 100%. The word of God for the people of God. If we really believe that this is the word of God, how can we not be in it daily? If the main thing is to grow in our spirit, and this is the word of the Lord, how can we not find the time to be daily in Bible study, privately and corporately? Thirdly, we ought to develop a more robust prayer life. Same story. If prayer is, if we believe what we say we believe, And prayer is talking with God, the the creator. How could could we not want to do that every single day? And I know it's hard, and I, as a pastor, I had trouble. I was busy. I had trouble carving out time, and I realized at one point, if I'm so busy that I can't carve out 10 minutes a day to talk with God, then I need to eliminate something from my life. I need to eliminate 10 minutes of something from my life. And fourth, let's develop our strengths and minimize our weaknesses. Let's emphasize the strengths and don't let the weaknesses monopolize our time. You know, when I coach football, what if you had a Uh, an offense, and you had nobody particularly speedy at wide receiver, and nobody particularly shifty, there's a weak spot on your team, and your quarterback couldn't throw the ball very well, why would you run a spread offense? That'd be stupid. But if on the other hand you had, you know, you had some big behemoths up front, on the line, and you had a couple of bruising running backs, and that quarterback who didn't throw well was a darn good runner, why wouldn't you run the ball? Why would you insist on running a spread offense and throwing it all over the place? Minimize your weaknesses, maximize your strengths. 
Paul says in the scriptures, not here, but in uh, uh, more than one other place, he uses athletics as a metaphor, and he really liked to talk about the race. He really saw things in terms of the race and pressing on to a finish line and, and winning a prize. He talks about that here in this scripture. And the Christian walk is a lot like a race, but not a sprint, not a 100-yard dash or a 100-meter or a dash, more like a marathon than a sprint. Because it's not just boom and it's over. It's ongoing. And not even, a, not even a marathon as much as a steeplechase. You know what a steeplechase is? Sometimes they do it on horseback, but they also do it on foot. It's a race where you got to climb over obstacles. you got to jump. Uh, heck, heck there, there are puddles involved in a steeplechase. In a steeplechase, the runners often fall down, have to get back up. The Christian walk is more like a steeplechase because you're not just going in, in a, a, a straight line for a short distance. It's long distance. And you're not just uh, going around and around a track. You get knocked down and you get back up. You gotta, you got to face obstacles. In fact, it's not even a steeplechase as much as it is an off-road car race. Do you know what an off-road car race is like? usually on dirt tracks, you have breakdowns, you have obstacles, you might have to ford a creek, you have detours. It's really like an off-road car race. Roadblocks, detours, breakdowns, need repair, that's my life. And sometimes you need a road map. And fortunately, we have a road map. And Paul says, press on. Don't give up. Don't quit. He uses himself as an example. He says, since meeting Christ, every good thing in my life I attribute to him. Before he was caught up in the game of the Pharisees, being the best by being the most righteous. And he had that game down pat. He, Paul wasn't just good at being a righteous Pharisee. He was exceptional. When Paul met Jesus, he realized that all the time he thought that he was in the driver's seat. And he was. But that doesn't mean he was going the right direction. He needed a navigator. Well, in this off-road race, you have a navigator. You're the driver. Don't make any mistake about that. You're the driver. You're making the decisions. God gave you free will, and you're, <coughs> you're driving. But you have a navigator in the seat beside you, and that's Jesus Christ. And the navigator's role is to get you where you want to go, to find direction for you and to be encouraging for you. You're in the driver's seat. Jesus is your navigator. Paul addresses the, Philipp uh, the Philippians, and he's, he's speaking words of encouragement. He's trying to help them understand and, and tell them not to give up, but to press on. Jesus does the same thing for us. And he does it through the church, and he does it through Bible study. Here's our map. You know, if, if, my, if I'm supposed to press on, and my goal is the pulpit, the finish line is the pulpit, and I'm pressing on, but I'm pressing on in this direction. I'm just pressing on and pressing on. I'm getting farther and farther from my goal all the time because I'm pressing on in the wrong direction. And that's what too many churches do. Let Jesus and the scriptures be our roadmap. Prayer. One of the ways we press on is through prayer. This fascinates me. 
I didn't know this until not long ago. You know, when the United States went to the moon, uh, it, the program was called the Apollo program. The Apollo spacecraft uh, was flown to the moon uh, and back. And uh, there was this guy from a little town in Ohio called Wapakoneta, maybe you've heard of it, uh, who was the first man on the moon, followed by several others. And I didn't know this, but that Apollo spacecraft, when it was headed for the moon, was off course 90% of the time. 90% of the time, that spacecraft was off course. Isn't that fascinating? You know why they didn't miss the moon completely when you're off course 90% of the time? Because they were in constant communication with mission control. And mission control constantly was sending the signals to the computers on board to correct their course. So they're off course 90% of the time, but it's constantly being adjusted. Constantly being adjusted. So they come out right where they're supposed to be. Our walk is like that. Are you off course ever? <clears throat> oh, yeah, you better be shaking your head. Sure you are, and so am I. I don't know if it's 90% of the time, but it's too much of the time. But we're not going to miss our goal because we're going to press on, like Paul says. And if we are in constant communication with mission control, we'll get to where we need to be. We have a mission control. And we have a means of communication. Prayer and Bible study. And then worship. I can't say enough about worship. Why do you come to worship? There are a lot of wrong reasons to come. To see friends, uh, good, good for your business, um, you like the music, uh, you like the pastor's message. Those aren't bad things, but they're not the reason to be here. You know why I come to, I've actually, I've thought about this a lot. And several years ago, I determined the reason why I come to worship is to be in the presence of God. Now, you can be in the presence of God anywhere. You can be in the presence of God in your bathtub or on the golf course. When you're in your room alone at home, God is there with you. But God is here in a very special way this morning. That's why Jesus said, where two or more of you are gathered together, I am there in the midst of you. It's in worship that, that we find the presence of God in a powerful way, through the music, or through the scripture, through the pre preaching. And just, as Jesus said, just because we're together, we're gathered together. This is our fuel NASA would have never got to the moon without fuel, and your dune buggy is, is doomed in that road race, off-road race, without fuel. This is our fuel. All we are and all we do begins in worship. This is where we are fueled to go out and live that Christian life, do those good deeds that we're called to do, Witness to our faith. This is fuel for the journey. The purpose of your life, we'll conclude with this. The purpose of your life is to know and serve the God who created you and who loves you and who wants to give you joy and peace. The purpose of your life is to feel that love and love him in return. The, the ultimate goal in your life is to please God and to receive what Paul calls in this reading the prize of eternal life with God in heaven. Are you focused on the one thing, the main thing, that will allow you to fulfill your purpose? and reach your ultimate goal? Does the rest of your life 
all those other good things in life, do they revolve around the main thing? Or are you allowing other things in life to pull you away from your center? Let's conclude with the question I want to to leave you with this morning, the thing I want you to leave here thinking about. It's that question that John Wesley asked his people. What is the state of your soul? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you're willing to be with us. You're willing to hear our prayers. You're willing to navigate for us and to teach us. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We ask that you would continue to lead and guide us today and always in Jesus' name. Amen. spirit and his love let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul oh let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your land. Jesus, oh Jesus, come. sing the song with gladness as your hearts are filled with joy lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name oh give him all your tears and sadness give him all your years of pain and you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.